I'm Dave Fardo from uh, University of Kentucky, as associate professor. I didn't of uh, biostatistics. I didn't last night talk about how excited I was because we had limited time. We still have limited time, but I think it's important to let you know how excited I am about this. <laughs> after moving into my dorm room A, um, I got extraordinarily excited. And then after this morning's sessions, I got more excited. There's so much synergy in what we've talked about thus far um, that will continue um, today. And so um, unlike Indianapolis, in Lexington, we all race horses. So if you, uh, when you come visit, um, we'll have you, um, I'll throw you on a horse and, and we'll go, we'll go uh, race, um, which, which should be great. Um, my goal, uh, my purpose for, for this talk is to prepare you, like Paul said, for tomorrow's tutorial. Um, there will be some slides that I'll likely fast forward through, but you'll have those as, as reference um, later on. Uh, and I'll highlight where having the exact understanding of a particular slide is not important, but understanding the heuristic is. Um, so I, I welcome like uh, the other speakers' um, um, uh, feedback and questions. And I also say the speakers for today have varying backgrounds. The one thing in common is the lack of formal genetics training. <laughs> So you might either feel empowered that you will become a, uh, a geneticist after this or scared that you will become a geneticist <laughs> after this. Um, okay, so uh, in the tutorial, there's a, um, a workflow diagram um, that talks about the pieces of GWAS and it talks about genetic variants, which we covered earlier this morning um, at some level, quality control, imputation, and so on. Um, you'll see all of these um, at some level in the tutorial and I'll try to fill in some gaps um, um, this morning, this afternoon, I guess now. Um, so my goal um, is, is that you can answer these questions um, at the end of uh, this talk. What are some of the historical landmarks of GWAS? It's important. We saw some earlier this morning, a, a great talk by Allison, um, and that I'll hope to build on some of that um, with, with less uh, personal knowledge uh, than she has, um, but some of the historical landmarks of GWAS. Um, what's unique about GWAS data and its quality control? And then how do you test for genetic association? Granted, there are tons of ways to test for genetic association. We're going to do very um, uh, focused, limited ways of testing for genetic association. But seeing some of the possibilities and some of the, again, history um, will hopefully let you uh, get a feel for um, what we'll be doing tomorrow. So thinking going towards GWAS, um, um, what are the, you saw a great example with APP this morning. Um, why do we think genetics plays a role? We might see differences in populations um, that have unique um, uh, histories uh, going through generations of those meiotic uh, um, processes of recombination, of flipping the coin and passing uh, a grand maternal or grand paternal chromosome. Um, uh, those happen in populations that um, uh, breed by themselves and inter intermarry at some point, but there's some natural uh, um, admixture that's um, lessened that we'll talk about a good bit. Uh, Tim Thornton we're gonna, is going to have a talk about admixture um, later. Familial aggregation was mentioned. We might see things that aggregate in families, and it could be that there's a genetic predisposition that drives the aggregation. It could be environmental. We talked a little bit about heritability and trying to parse the environmental piece and the genetic piece. I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. And then linkage. So that was mentioned before, and I'll have a two-cent version of linkage just so that we can move into association. Um, so here's linkage, <laughs> two-cent version. <laughs> First cent, and you saw this before, so maybe I'm borrowing a cent from earlier. Use properties of recombination to localize the, the genetic, the... the uh, DSL, the disease susceptibility locus, um, and we track transmissions through families. So thinking about how that crossing over and that recombination process happens, if, the, if the, a disease and the locus are co-segregating, um, then it gives us evidence to narrow down uh, genetically where that um, player is. Um, so we track those, and I have to make a, um, I'll use the appropriate pointer a, a, a call to, to about Thomas Hunt Morgan, who's a Lexingtonian, so uh, a Nobel laureate who is uh, involved in um, the chromosomal theory of heredity. Um, so again, when you come to horse race with us, we'll go to the Hunt Morgan house as well. Um, the second sentence, the pr pr principle of similarity, 
Um, uh, Tim mentioned IBD at some point, identical by descent. And so the idea here was, uh, I love when things are, are um, old ideas that get um, um, perpetuated. SIB pairs that are phenotypically similar should also be genotypically similar. And so the idea that is that if we see similar, uh, uh, similarities in siblings phenotypically, the more than we'd expect, um, we expect there to be similarities uh, genotypically. So these ideas of identical by uh, state or descent uh, for a particular um, allele uh, inform us a couple different ways, uh, parametric, non-parametric ways of, of identifying linkage. So really narrowing down where we think uh, genetic um, susceptibility is. I'll go a little bit more into recombination. You saw it earlier. Um, I think it's worthwhile uh, a little bit more. We have two loci, A and B. At each locus, two possible alleles. These could be A or T or C or G. Um, I'm calling them generically A1, B1, A1, A2, A1, and B1, B2. So two different um, loci, four possible haplotypes. Okay, so we have um, A1, B1, A1, B2, A2, B1, and A2, B2. So four possible um, matchings on a, a particular chromosome. Um, sometimes these pairs are called diplotypes. And so we have four plus three plus two plus one different diplotype pairs. Um, recombination is only detectable in double heterozygotes. We can't figure out transmissions from parent to offspring. We can't figure out whether there's a, a recombination or not except in these double heterozygotes. And so that limits some of our resolution to be able to uh, um, track uh, via, via linkage analysis. Um, so, so how exactly does that work? So I have here uh, A1, B1, and A2, B2. Okay, so on one chromosome, well, uh, from, from one, uh, um, we'll say chromosome. It doesn't necessarily uh, uh, reside on the same chromosome. We've got two loci, A1 and B1. Um, and on the next one is A2 and B2. And so how do those get passed? Flip of a coin. Um, the gametes A1, B1, that one got selected to be passed on to the next generation. Or A2, B2. A2, B2, okay? That's ignoring recombination. If there's a recombination between those two uh, uh, loci, um, then we'll see something different. So here, uh, one of those gets passed along, but we have recombination between. So there's a crossing over between those two loci. And what gets passed on is A1, B2. Okay, and so I can parameterize that. I'm going to show some math, um, but P Paul appropriately um, demathed some of my, my slides so that I can talk about concepts rather than getting lost in uh, math. I, I, for, for tomorrow's talk, I removed 20-some slides. <laughs> um, but I have to. The, the Hippocratic Oath of Statisticians suggests that I have to have math. So, so here we see the, the coin flip, half is getting uh, this A1, B1 is getting transmitted to the offspring. And then it gets hit with this recombination rate, theta. Okay, so either you get the um, uh, um, pair inherited together or there's a um, crossing over between those two um, with theta chance of recombination rate. Okay, so I can break down the other side there too, but we have, so we have this transmission probability, should sum to one, something happened right, probability is one. Um, and this recombination rate ranges between zero and 0 0.5, okay? There's no recombinations, they're completely linked, that recombination rate is zero. And we can see that here, these guys fall away, those guys are inherited together. Um, if it's a half, then these four combinations are equally likely. Okay, so if these two loci were on different chromosomes, for example, what we learned earlier about independent assortment is that those four combinations should be equally probable. Okay, um, so no recombination, theta zero, completely unlinked, theta's a half. Again, easiest way for me to think about being unlinked is just two loci on different chromosomes. All right, okay. Moving from linkage to association, uh, a, like a page and a half paper in science from 1996, Neil Reish and Kathleen Mary Kangas, um, has the genetic study of complex disorders reached its limits 20 years ago. What I find really cool about this 
um, is the prescience of these, uh, these folks. That they say, we argue, argue below that linkage is maybe dead, and that's not the case at all. We're kind of seeing a resurgence in the necessity for linkage with rare variants. Um, but the future of genetics of complex diseases is likely to require large-scale testing by association analysis. Sound, sound like what we're doing? Um, it, it is. And so the, uh, it's fascinating that 21 years ago um, this came out. So I'll use this slide to jump from linkage to association. Um, I think this is a good way. There's a, another couple um, pictures of this, but I think this is a good one. If you can see up top um, the idea that there's a disease, a mutation here in this red, and what we do in linkage studies is we track transmissions of these ancestral haplotypes, and we see if disease tracks with um, the, a particular location, if it gets split up by recombination or not. And it, it, uh, Allison mentioned earlier that we have only so much generational information. We need a lot of recombinations, right? Association can be viewed as kind of like link, uh, a, a large-scale, multi-generational linkage study where we have these ancestral haplotypes get mixed up um, from recombination. And we're really trying to figure out, is this mutation, do we see it more frequently in cases or controls? Uh, um, so it's similar. Um, it's just a, like, like a long, um, uh, big co-inheritance linkage study. Um, we, we frame it in, in, in a different fashion. Um, okay, so a couple principles that will help us, inform us of, of how GWAS works. Linkage disequilibrium, not linkage, but li linkage disequilibrium um, measures how um, uh, similar, how associated alleles are. So to define it, a definition, allelic association um, between two different genetic loci. So a, a decent mnemonic is linkage loci and association alleles. Um, so here we're looking at the association between alleles. And I'll do a couple things of math, um, um, but not much. Okay, so each definition of linkage, and, and you can see in the literature seven, eight different definitions of linkage disequilibrium. I'll show you a couple. Um, it degrades over generations. So if, if, if I have um, two alleles that are associated at two loci, the process of recombination is going to break that association down at some level, and we'll, see, we'll, we'll parameterize that in a second. Um, and its properties are used for GWAS. Okay? Um, so we go back to this. Um, I can look at the frequencies of each of these um, gametes, and then I can look at the frequency of the alleles. And if these two... Um, Loci, if these alleles of these two loci are independent of one another, then the frequency I see of the A1, B1 should just be the product of those A1 times a, the probability of an A1 times the probability of a B1. So I can do a little bit of, um, of algebra and come up with this D metric that just measures the difference between what we observe and what we expect if those two guys are really not associated if they're independent of one another. Okay, so I can get towards um, this, this idea of, of D. I'm going to just define a couple things really quickly. Um, I can measure after one generation of random mating. We saw random mating is probably not a, a thing, but it's, it's, it's good enough. I'll, I'll mention some assumptions that don't hold completely, but hold well enough for the, the properties to work. Um, we can, again, do a little bit of, of algebra and show that after one generation, this, this metric of, distort, or of, of disequilibrium gets hit by a factor of one minus theta. Okay? So if those two alleles, those two loci, are in complete linkage, um, if they're tightly together and they always get inherited together, my recombination rate is going to be zero, and I'll maintain that D. Okay, this guy doesn't change. D at time one is the same as D at time zero. If they're completely unlinked, if they're on two different chromosomes, it gets cut by a factor of a half. So we can see here, um, if we start with a, 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 um, a perfect D and hit it with a theta of a half or a theta of one after 10 generations, that metric gets um, reduced 
Okay, so over time, over generations, it gets um, um, hit. Um, that D, prime, uh, D metric is not good for certain reasons, one being that it's, it doesn't go from zero or negative one to one, like a, like a correlation you might think of. Um, we can scale it to get that way. D prime is, is one of the most common metrics of LD. Um, now it ranges from uh, negative one to one if we just scale it by this D max. R squared, most common, uh, commonly used LD metric, it's just a squared correlation coefficient. So this is the same as the covariance. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. So would you say that you have to have many generations to figure this out? Um, no. You do not need to have many generations to figure this out. Um, you can look at, um, at a single time point. Um, but it just degrades over time. Okay. It degrades over time. So at any point, you'll have a, a D-metric. You might get into this, but can you interpret the R-squared in this context in words for me, is it, it's the percentage of variation that's what? It's the, it's the um, correlation coefficient between two alleles at two, at two loci. It's a squared correlation coefficient between those two. So if it were one, you would, if you have the A1 allele at that particular, at the first locus, you will necessarily have the B1 at that locus. If it's negative one, it's vice versa. So the R squared is kind of like the proportion of the time that A1 and B1 are together? Seen together, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the, the, the same as the covariant, uh, the correlation divided by the uh, um, product of the uh, root variation, of the standard deviations. Okay? Okay, but we didn't need that. Um, you need to have an understanding of what LD is and how it's um, degraded um, because GWAS is going to use that, um, the fact that there's redundancy at some level in the genome, right? As things are inherited together, when GWAS chips were made initially, that redundancy was used in order to um, scale down the number of uh, SNPs that actually had to get um, assayed. And so tag SNPs was, and haplotagger and all kinds of things were used that you don't necessarily see, but on a GWAS trip, chip, they're designed so that um, we use this, this idea of LD to not um, use redundant information. Okay. This moves us towards imputation. Um, another piece of that workflow that we'll see um, tomorrow, yeah, imputation. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that's big, great questions. Can you learn about distance? Absolutely. Um, there is such thing as long-range LD, but in general, um, there's a natural relationship between distance and LD. It's not a, per a perfect one-to-one uh, um, -one mapping by any shape in the imagination. Uh, um, uh, the second question is about populations and age of the population. We'll see in the next few slides, a perfect segue, um, in the next few slides that exactly. So your intuition is what is the intuition that the powers that be had um, to do some of the large, large scale projects, genotyping projects um, nationwide. So that specifically the international hat map um, um, project um, quantified that explicitly for that very reason to figure out, right? And we'll see more about admixture tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I'll continue with this. And I've given a lot of papers thrown in here, so if you are really interested in delving into these papers, they're up on the slides. Um, Human Genome Project, um, again, with the synergy from the earlier talks, uh, Allison mentioned having um, markers. And we only had a few markers, and the, the maps got better and better. Um, we had to have reliable ways to find something in the genome, and it wasn't a trivial process. The Human Genome Project which was, I say, kind of completed in 2003, um, was an attempt at mapping the entire genome. And it used two males and two females um, for this mapping project. It's a fascinating um, history of um, public-private partnerships 
and um, how they can go right or wrong. I'm not sure exactly. Bill Clinton uh, introduced the completion of this project with um, uh, Craig Venter at Solera Genomics and um, Francis Collins, who was then the head of the NHGRI and now is the head of NIH, um, to say, hey, we jointly finished this, you know, and one big happy family of uh, um, company and uh, the public. Nah. So here's the hat map. The hat map tried to extend this, this mapping project. Um, initially, it was 270, 269 um, people, and it has been expanded. And the goal of this was to look at more people in diverse populations to figure out what is the pattern of recombination. How, um, how, do, uh, how tightly in LD um, are markers between populations and across populations. And I'll show you a map of where those come from in a second. Um, the Thousand Genomes Project followed suit. 2010, 12, 15 were different phases of this Thousand Genomes Project. Any guesses on how many people were in the Thousand Genomes? <laughs> 1,092, actually. Um, and, and that has been built on. It's over 2,500 now. Um, but the idea there was to extend, really, this, uh, this hat, hat project to get more resolution from a, um, uh, the, the number of markers, the number of variants, and more people from more diverse populations. So Haplotype Reference Consortium is kind of the next stage of this, uh, the next um, project, uh, large-scale project. Um, first release is about 65,000 haplotypes. Okay, so... For imputation, um, I'll show you this little picture. Uh, actually, uh, before I go to that, the All of Us, um, the Precision Me Medicine Initiative. Or maybe the, I think I learned this at the School of Redundancy School, um, the PMI Initiative, um, the ATM machine. Um, this is shooting to get, uh, I think, a million, um, million folks to get um, a whole genome uh, data. I'm going to describe this picture and that's going to be, I think, what we'll do for imputation. Um, I think in the tutorial we already have either previously imputed or uh, non-imputed data, um, but it's not uh, um, so difficult to impute. Um, here, what the top is are reference haplotypes. Okay, so these are a single chromosome for a single individual, and yes, no for the alternative allele, so zeros and ones. Zero for the reference allele, one's for the alternative allele. And this, this is, a, um, and I think Jonathan Martini's lab, Impute 2, um, you can, they're kind of ordered that these are close, and you kind of see this gap. We talked about recombination hotspots last time, so maybe these signal a recombination hotspot where you expect that there's a, a, a dampening of the LD between these. Um, so I have haplotypes here, and in the GWAS data, you get a count of alleles. Okay, so at each locus, at each variant, you get a count of how many of the A allele do you have, if the A allele is the, um, is the alternative allele. So for the first subject, as opposed to ha having a haplotype, this first subject at this variant has one alternative allele, and we don't have these <coughs> measured. The question marks are where we don't have those variants measured at all. Question. Um, like what s data set serves as the reference or which, var uh, which allele serves as the yeah, reference? Which, which allele? I mean, There's multiple different... Um, um, we, we tend to use the one that's less frequent to be the um, alternative allele. So you're always counting... <laughs> but like was mentioned about APOE, E4 is the ancestral allele. So oftentimes that will be um, uh, uh, the reference allele, and then the alternate will be the others. And the other complication is that the reference allele might be different based on the population. Right. Right. And to add on the fun there, we might have multiple studies that are all working together, and if we uh, parameterize the, uh, um, the zeros, ones, and twos based on the minor allele, the minor allele could change in those, in those cohorts. Is what, what Allison was saying with populations, those could change in the cohorts. So we'd have to pick uh, 
um, something consistent so that we're not. Um, you can choose it for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this particular individual, so the GWAS chip is, um, measures the variance in black. And we might want more information than what we see in uh, the GWAS chip. And we can use these reference haplotypes that um, from 1,000 genomes or HapMap or now HRC um, that give us information on how often these uh, alleles are inherited together. Okay? So we're, we're borrowing information based on, over generations, what has um, uh, um, happened, how often these get inherited together. And so for this first individual, for example, we see uh, one, two, a zero, a zero, one, and one. And we might, this block right here might be always inherited together or very frequently inherited together. And we see in this simple example, this person is a two. Um, so they could be a combination of this haplotype twice, this haplotype twice, or this haplotype and this haplotype. And if we look more closely, we see that um, if we think that this is... Um, in tight LD with this particular variant, we would know that it has to be the first row and the third row so that this haplotype and this haplotype add up to one allele. So, so this is a crude, um, a crude example. Um, but the idea, yeah, I can. So this particular individual in the first row of the study genotypes block, that's our GWAS data. Okay, so that's a, the variance and a count of the, we'll say, minor alleles um, at each of these variants in black. All right? So for the first individual, there are a 1 here, a 2 here, a 0 here, a 0, a 1, and a 1. So I might want to borrow information from the reference haplotypes. Okay, so I have these reference haplotypes from one of these, um, probably the most recent one, HRC, because um, the most recent is always better, right, Joey? Um, so, so this particular one, I can gain information um, like we did with the pedigree. Here I've got a two. So I know that they got two of the alternative alleles. All right? And so which haplotypes are consistent with that two? Well, I know that each haplotype has to have that alternative allele. Okay? So I'd have to either have two of these, two of these, or one, one, one and one. And I can use the um, the LD between the, uh, these blocks to inform which combination works. And so these are built on probability models. Um, and um, at the end of the day, you would get a probability vector that we think that this, is, uh, um, this particular haplotype is this probable or this particular genotype is that probable. So the heuristic is that we use this information here to, inform, to fill in these with some level of imprecision. Correct. Correct. And the zero is a zero plus zero, so um, um, we can infer back from that uh, haplotype. Each, each column is a particular variant. A variant. Yep. Okay. And so the number is reflecting the number of alleles that are different for that variant. Sorry, can you no. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this is why um, Paul said no, no, don't don't put numbers up there because you're going to get in a, in a wormhole. Um, here's the, so down here is a is a, is your study. This is this is ADNI one. Okay, so these are each row is an ADNI one subject. Each column is that is in black is a genotyped SNP. Okay, so it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. And those zero ones or twos are just the counts of the minor alleles at that particular SNP. So just, just jump in here. Yeah, so please, thank you. Is a homozygous carrier of the minor alleles. Yeah. A zero is a homozygous carrier of the major alleles. Does that make sense? Okay. So a two would be like capital A capitalist, or lowercase a lowercase a. A zero would be capital A capitalist. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. And we'll. I'll show you this again later on. This is just kind of an allusion to the um, idea of imputation. Go ahead. So to do the imputation, it's going to depend on how many reference samples you have. Like, you know, what the Correct. Correct. Right. 
Absolutely. And, and there will be probability vectors that suggest I'm, I'm almost sure that this particular variant is a 2 for this subject. Or I'm not quite sure. I, my, if I had to guess, this would be a 1. This would be a heterozygote. But I'm not that confident. So there are quality metrics that you can decide, does this pass a threshold um, uh, or not? And, I, and again, I'll get into to mathematizing this a, a, a little bit more in terms of how do we take a heterozygote or a homozygote major, a homozygote minor, and how do we codify that so that we can end up testing an association. This is... Uh, um, yeah, an illusion. Well, this is, this is a, I think, a good um, visualization of what imputation does heuristically. Um, maybe I can come back to this if, if it's, um, yeah, if we have time. I'm just going to throw these up here quickly and let you look at them as reference. I find it fascinating. Here's something from 2003 about the Human Genome Project. A goal was to identify the approximate 30,000 genes in the human DNA. How many genes are in human DNA? I think it's a lot less than that, right? So it's a moving number, and early on it was guessed to be 100. We're a lot more complex than rice and mice, right? And so we'd expect that that, like, that degree of complexity would increase the number of genes, and it ends up being maybe we're less complex at that level than we thought. Yes. So this was alluded to earlier as well. So, so alternative splicing, right? So, so there's a lot of different things that can happen um, with moving from DNA to RNA. Um, some discussion over lunch about SNP-SNP interaction, inter genes interacting with one another, um, the pathways. So there's a lot more complexity in humans than is just defined by the number of genes in humans. Um, so, I, but I think that this is um, funny, that, or not funny, uh, um, that it was 30,000. Mean, it just gives you some perspective of the thought leaders and how that has changed with, the, with the, the, these projects. It was declared, declared, finished, um, two years ahead of schedule. Um, I think it's funny. When I asked what little girls are made of, I was hoping he would say sugar and spice. And that's, I've, like Paul mentioned, I've got two little girls, so I feel like I always give them much more complex than they request. And so there, there's those girls. Like, oh, Daddy, you can look at the... Uh, um, look. So, so the hat map, the question earlier was, was about populations, and this hat map was in, intended to look at uh, initially four populations, a Yoruba and African population, um, a Japanese, a Chinese, and a, a Ceph European uh, um, population. And look at the patterns of um, LD within and between these populations. Okay, so we could look at, um, get an idea of variation as opposed to just mapping, which I say just, and then realize, again, that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Mapping was a huge, huge task. But now we're looking at uh, getting information about var uh, variability between and among individuals or uh, populations. So this is the haplotype map. Um, Second generation, here we get 3.1 million SNPs. Um, 1,000 genomes gets us towards you know, 8 million some. And then, um, um, and then the haplotype reference consortium now is you know, 37, 38 million SNPs. Um, 1,000 genomes, um, the initial phase, again, was 1,092 uh, from 14 populations as opposed to four, so branching out from the original hat map. Um, the final phase had 26 populations. So we learned more and more about um, genetic diversity um, across populations. Uh, again, this, we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, later on. Um, yes, so lots of papers. So if you're really interested in any one of these projects, you can um, look at a host of these papers. And I think the original um, Thousand Genomes uh, paper was some, like 700 authors. So a lot of people putting in to these, these efforts. Um, you're going to keep me honest on time, right? Um, okay. So here's a picture um, from where. And you can see um, four of the populations. Here's the, the Europeans um, that uh, I think came from Cache County even, um, uh, the Cache County study, the uh, Japanese and the Han Chinese population, and then the Yoruban um, population. Those were 
the original hat map. And again, that's expanded over the, um, the uh, time frames of these, these different initiatives. HRC, um, I think this is extending now. It's about 65,000 haplotypes now. You can't see this. You can see it, we blow it up in the slide. Um, but tons of participating cohorts that have given data to, um, this is a, a managed at, at University of Michigan. What's nice about this imputation, you can load your genotype files to their server, and they will spit out to you the imputed data. Um, so as opposed to having to run that um, with fewer data points um, or a smaller reference panel, for example, um, you can send it to their server and have them impute it for you, which is nice. But to take home from this, many subjects, many, many subjects, many populations, and many variants. Okay, so these large-scale... Yeah, go ahead, Ava. You know, I, I don't know the ins and outs of all, all of those. I know that um, the original hat map selected, um, they had several trios, so they could, they could actually build those um, haplotype maps rather than um, not have that, like, transmission information from parent to offspring. Um, but how they were selected and whether they had to be there for a long period of time, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh-oh. Absolutely. And so is that part of the process? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. And so, so um, if you, if you can explore these fairly readily. Like, for, for example, you can go to the Thousand Genomes website um, and, and, and isolate things if by the um, population or the continent or, or what, what have you. Yes. Yes, Jennifer. And related to that, just so that I can maybe try to understand the potential a little bit more, um, is, um, is it harder to impute older populations? Great insight. Yes. So, so one of the big take-home points from the hat map initially and f- further on, which... Um, which population do you think had the highest amount of genetic diversity? Which do you think, similarly, had the least amount of um, within population LD, like the lower LD across? So... The Yorubans, the original HapMap population, were the most diverse. They had more generations to flip the coins, <laughs> and they had more generations to cross over and to break down that, those, those allelic associations, as opposed to the European population, which has high, higher LD. So if you think about designing a GWAS panel, for example, that has implications there. So, right? So, it, you, you, you use that LD, but the LD is present more so in the European population than the African population, for example. Ava? There's a gap in my understanding of population uh, age. So, would you say that the population is more diverse? Right. Greg. So, so my la- I'm not a population geneticist. I'll, I'll, I'll d- defer. Like there are bottlenecks and all kinds of things that um, uh, define that. I don't know if, if anyone wants to give a. Can you say it loud, please? Yeah. yeah. 
less time for more jam to see to build up over generations compared to the population of people that are living. A lot more private scientific. Right, 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 right. I mean, that's another interesting, like the 20, whole 23 and Me thing is a fascinating uh, um, uh, progression as well. Okay, so I'm going to get into some quality control and talk about that, hopefully heuristically, and let you know, give you some references to, to look more in depth um, just for the sake of time. We want quality data, garbage in, garbage out. Um, here, what's unique here? Well, we know about Mendelian inheritance, right? So if we had parents and offspring and mom was AA and dad was AA and child was AB, so something happened. Was it a mutation event, which we can assume happened infrequently and so on? Well, we can use that information if we have family data, for example. There's sample, duplica sample duplication for concordance, um, uh, call rate, uh, chromosomal anomalies, a lot of things that are specific to um, genetic study, to the GWAS assays or sequencing that we can, um, we can use. Um, population genetics, I'll, I'll mention briefly Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, a, a lot of research in this area and protocols get updated. And I'll, I'll show you um, uh, one that's, that's used quite frequently here or here, over there at UW. Um, um, but I'll mention Hardy-Weinberg just quickly. Allele and genotype frequencies remain constant over time. So allele and genotype frequencies remain constant over time. So the, the allele itself and then the combination of, of two alleles, the genotype frequencies remain constant when all these things happen. Big population, random mating, no mutation, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, but in practice, um, when things are out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, they get back in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium fairly frequently or fairly quickly in one generation with all these things holding true. Take-home point is that we can derive the expected genotype frequencies um, from allele frequencies, okay? And if those deviate, it gives us a clue that there may be something wrong. One of these assumptions doesn't hold. In the context of GWAS, it's been typically, maybe there's a genotyping error, okay? So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium testing is used as a screener for um, GWAS, just to give you a quick. Or maybe it's actually an association. Eh, I'm, I'm running away. I'm running away. Um, it, it, but we, we've actually published the, the recommendation that instead of algorithmically following uh, quality control, that you, you go back and secondarily test those SNPs that were out, out of Hardy-Weinberg. Um, so, so instead of like removing those completely, maybe it, maybe it's worth looking at them um, um, in, in a secondary analysis, for example. But the, Sorry, yeah, absolutely. So I'm sure there are some relationships between population age and linkage disequilibrium, but I'm taking this as a completely independent, um, just in the context of quality control, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is something that we can examine when we have a GWAS. Um, um, uh, say, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Are right. But um, I test an African American sample and that's off. Right. Off. So do, then am I saying that um, there's a genotyping error? No, but you, but you'd still see. Go ahead, go ahead, okay. Allison. You'd still you'd still be. You wouldn't have Hardy Weinberg disequilibrium in that case because that sample you'd this this property would still hold. Yeah. Because it's minor alleles. Yeah. Well, then there's a issue within it. 
I mean, the equation, you have to go the equation up. I don't. I, <laughs> I know. I've got, I've got more equations at the end. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I shouldn't do this. Right, right, that's true. That's true. And then you can do Hardy Warnberg as a test to see if you appropriately did that. But then when you don't have the full reference snips for April E4 in African American. Most AD samples actually have it genotype separate. Right. Yeah. I would not recommend using imputed actually genotypes right. in any study. Gr great questions. And sorry, like these are great questions. Um, and a lot of population genetics. What does the uh, about yeah. Right. It does seem like the assumptions that go into the hardy white equilibrium are ones that help explain population, that, to answer the original question, help explain what we mean when we talk about populations being older and younger. That these populations are older and younger because of migration, mutation, and population, bottom next. That's yeah. the sort of thing. So they're separate concepts. Separate. The assumptions, I think, might. And the nice thing with Hardy Weinberg, if, if there are disequilibriums, they get back an equilibrium within a, a generation. So that's why it's used frequently for quality control of genetic data. Okay. Uh, I, we, we'll take this offline if there's more. I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile, but I think we need to um, move on. I, will, I mentioned earlier, but the beginning of the talk, that I might speed through some stuff. I, I had, didn't. <laughs> but I, I think I will now. Um, there are protocols. In fact, there's a great one um, with GWAS tools um, that's, that's done here from uh, the Geneva Coordinating Center at uh, UW that goes into a whole lot of things that are specific to GWAS that's outside the scope of um, a, a one-hour talk or even the tutorial that we'll see. But you can take a look at this. Um, it's, it's, it's well laid out. Um, and you can see some of the ways, some additional ways that these uh, data are unique. Um, so this might help, um, might, might have been nice to have before the um, imputation piece, but modes of inheritance. Coding genotypes. Again, I want to, um, a goal is to get an idea of uh, um, what the math is that goes into testing for a SNP disease association, Okay. So here, if we have a biallelic marker, a SNP that has two different possibilities, here A or G, um, this particular location, this fancy chromosome, two chromosomes that are drawn here, the data itself looks like this, a fam well, pretty much like this, a family ID, an individual ID, and then what the two alleles are at that particular marker, at that particular SNP. So here, the first individual is an AA, the second is AG, the third is a GG, okay? Modes of inheritance. This was mentioned in the genetics talk. In complex disease genetics, it's a, it could be argued that this is a bit of a misnomer, the idea of mode of inheritance, but it's, it gets codified in the assumptions that we make when we test for associations. So here's a little picture. Um, we have... Mom and dad, um, both are carriers. They're heterozygotes at this particular um, um, variant. Um, daughter one gets neither passed. Son one gets one. Daughter two gets one. Son two gets both. So each of those, if we think about how that particular variant affects disease risk, okay, or affects a quantitative phenotype, um, we can codify it in the same flavors of mode of inheritance as was mentioned before. Additive, recessive, dominant are the most common. Dominant says that if you have the risk allele, your risk is increased. Recessive says that you need both alleles to be the alternative allele to, to increase your risk. And an additive suggests on some scale there's an increase for each risk allele. Okay, so this is the, the, the um, codification of the SNP.
mathematically. I'm translating these guys um, somehow, and I'll, go, I'll show you this um, uh, again and again. I'll show you it a couple, to- a couple more times um, just to hammer this home. If I have an additive mode of inheritance, I've got the zeros, ones, and twos, the ones that are homozygous major, heterozygous, and heterozy- or, um, homozygous minors here on the x-axis. And the phenotype here, a continuous phenotype, you can see the mean of that increases on the same scale for each number of risk allele. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so if here I, I had a, a linear regression, if I put this in a linear regression framework, I'd have this intercept beta naught, and I'd have this slope beta 1. Okay? For each additional allele, my mean increases by beta 1. Similarly, for a dominant mode of inheritance, I can collapse the 1 and the 2. They both have the risk allele. For recessive, I don't have the increased risk until I have two copies of the disease allele. Okay, so to throw this into the, what you'll see tomorrow, these fancy data sheets, um, I've got those same subjects, um, subjects one, two, three, and four. First is AA, second is AG, third is, or, uh, a, yeah, third is GG, and so on. And if A is the risk allele, the additive mode of inheritance counts up the number of risk alleles. So the first person is an AA, one plus one, Two. So this person is a two. All right? Second person carries one A. Third person has none, none, and the fourth has two. Does that make sense? Okay, great, great. Similarly for dominant, I'm just codifying the assumption that you only have to have one disease allele, risk allele, to increase your predisposition or to increase the mean of that outcome. So this person, does they have, do they have a, this is an indicator, do they have an A or not? Yes, yes, no, yes. Similarly for recessive, do they have two A's or not? Yes, no, no, yes. Okay? Cool. So yep, yep. There, yeah, so it's an indicator. Yeah, 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 it's an indicator. Um, a question was asked earlier about codominance. Um, I could not assume that there's a natural relationship between the number of alleles, like an additive 0, 1, 2, and I could use a codominant model. It might be that the, um, the heterozygotes, for whatever reason, their predisposition lies outside of the, the homozygotes, either below or above. I can codify that same um, um, relationship or that same assumption by just having two dummy variables, Okay. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Is this coding given to us? So, you know that first sheet you showed us? Yeah. That had 0, 1, and 2 in the other polls. So, do you normally assume that it would be the data file get 0, 1s, and 2s, and then you later decide? You specify what, what your mode of inheritance okay. is, yeah. So, typically, and, and granted, different programs do things differently, and that's one of the big challenges is to make sure that your data are in the proper format and so on and so forth, um, but your program... Well, uh, you, you will have the opportunity to specify explicitly. Um, um, sometimes you have to code it yourself, different programs. Plink, you don't. Okay. How am I doing on time, Mary Paul? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Ava. Uh, I think you've just seen the additive code. Yeah. You know, using that way, the one that you use is not going to be recessing, right? Do you ever know specifically that you can use that, or do people just keep it So for GWAS, the vast vast, vast majority assume additive mode of inheritance. In fact, there, and there's good reason for that. Um, um, if you're wrong, you don't want it to be so bad. And, right? So if, if there's really a recessive mode of inheritance or a dominant mode of inheritance and you've specified additive, it won't be so bad. If, you, on the other hand, you specify or you assume a recessive mode of inheritance and the true... Um, pattern really is more additive, then you lose power. Okay, so if you misspecify, assuming an additive mode of inheritance, it's not so bad. And I actually had, um, I had some slides about that, and I think I pulled those out. Yeah, I did. 
Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah. That's true. And so, so this is in the context of GWAS. Tomorrow, when we talk about power, I'm going to show a program that's that's accessible and point and click that um, that allows for specification of other modes of inheritance. So you can actually see the effect of that mode of inheritance on the power that you can garner. And so the idea there more is that like you might it, it, it suspect a particular gene, so you're looking more targetedly um, than GWAS. Okay, so test of association. I'm going to to throw up a couple different throw up. I'm going to regurgitate a couple um, tests of association just to kind of build towards what we'll do. We'll tip, we're going to throw things in a regression framework at the end of the day. It's nice to see at some level um, some of the progression I think of um, tests for association. I mentioned the co for discrete traits the Cochrane Armitage trend test, alleles test, and the general chi square, and then. For other types, we'll see oh, you can use continuous, time to event, multivariate. The nice thing about a regression framework is it's extraordinarily flexible. It allows for um, adjustments of covariates. Um, it allows for a, a large bit of machinery that um, you still have to respect the fact that you're dealing with genetic data. But at the you can treat these SNPs almost like another any other covariate that you're um, you're interested in. So don't worry about this at all. But I just have a you you can't worry about it. Nothing's fine. I, I like to I like to worry about it. Um, a Cochrane Armitage trend test is just a two by three table where I'm breaking up the disease status yes or no by the allele count. Zero, one, two, three. So this is just genotype by disease. So I've got an outcome that's a disease, Alzheimer's disease. And I've recruited folks. I've got uh, this number in zero that are affected, A, A zero, this number that are one, heterozygous that are affected, and so on. Okay? I can take this two by th three table and do a Cochrane Armitage trend test, which is the same as doing an assumption of additivity in a regression framework, which is really nice. But I have this chi-square on one degree of freedom. I can do a simple test. I can calculate um, my significance um, at the end of the day and figure out whether or not um, the allele is associated with disease status. So for your typical biostat class or epidemiology class, a two by three table, um, I can codify this association between the allele and disease. Okay, I know how this this statistic is distributed. I know its um, properties in large samples, and I can get a p-value at the end of the day. Alleles test is not commonly used, but you might think I, I just want to count the numbers of alleles as opposed to um, or by allele rather than um, by genotype. Um, I'm going to pass over that one. Um, I could do a general chi-square, makes different assumptions. So in, instead here, like the trend test where I'm, there's an implicit assumption of additivity, here I'm not making any assumptions about the relationship of disease predisposition as I go from zero, one, or two copies of the minor allele. So here I could have that codominance, for example. Go ahead, Rachel. So Absolutely. Based on, yeah, so, so yeah. For each SNP, you mean? So in your contingency tables, you basically, within each of these cells. Oh, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, using, I'm using the additivity here um, to, to create this statistic. Here, I do not. Here, I just, I use these, these margins, um, um, which is why. Which is why this is a chi-square on two degrees of freedom, and this is a chi-square on one degree of freedom. Right. 
let's, let's just get to the general case of logistic regression, linear regression. We're going to be doing logistic regression, linear regression in our uh, tutorial. I've got a simple model. I showed one on a continuous trait, beta naught plus beta one X, where X is that genotype coding. However, you've assumed the mode of inheritance, right? So it's either, you can assume dominant. You can assume a whole host of different things. We'll, we'll stick in the realm of dominant, recessive, and additive. Defaulting to additive and using others um, should the case uh, um, warrant. Um, and we can interpret this model uh, here in the additive setting um, as the increase in um, the log odds for each allele, each risk allele. Okay, so the log of um, beta one is a uh, um, confer or shows a conference of a one unit increase. So this is just like an odds ratio in a two by three table. So the increase in odds um, for an increase in the number of um, uh, risk alleles. This was going back to the codominance model. If I have a codominance model where I don't want to make an assumption about the relationship between 0, 1, and 2 alleles, I can just throw in another dummy variable. So they each get estimated, th those means get estimated um, independently of one another. Um, okay, so let's get towards GWAS. We're almost, we're almost, we're almost there. Um, I will set up here, I show a, a linear regression, simplified linear regression, and a simplified logistic regression. I have a whole bunch of SNPs that I test. You already saw a Manhattan plot. Here's another like a, a, a fake Manhattan plot where I just show the chromosomal position and a transformed p-value. So the, the magic number was mentioned earlier. Like, so for those that haven't done large-scale genetic studies, what's the smallest p-value you've ever seen? <laughs> right? Right? And so now, in this, in this world, the magic number is no longer the Fisherian 1 out of 20.05, but rather a corrected 0.05 divided by a million. That's where that magic 5 times 10 to the negative 8 number came from. And the idea there is we have to do some flavor. It's, it's, it's an infamous adjustment, I'll mention that. Um, but that magic number came from the, the idea that there are at most a million independent tests in the whole genome. Okay, so regardless of how many you look at, that's the genome-wide significance level. So this Manhattan plot takes that p-value and transforms it in a way so that a really, really, really small p-value, 5 times 10 to the negative 8 is a really, really small value is really, really high here. So we take the log 10 of the p-value and take minus that. So, so 1 times 10 to the negative 8 here, 1 times 10 to the negative 8, 0.000000001. Maybe I got the number of zeros right. Maybe it is. Um, that would be an 8 here. It would be a negative 8, and then we take the negative of that, it would be an 8 here. Okay. So that transformation allows us to quantify how much significance at the, each of these. Uh, so that's, that's another uh, picture of a, um, a Manhattan plot. I'm going to mention a couple other things. Um, I'll give you some take-home points from this section. There are a lot of different ways to test for genetic association. We can only cover a handful here. We'll talk about gene-based tests at some level as well, talk about gene-gene interaction at some level. Mode of inheritance, it might be a misnomer in complex disease genetics, but it allows us to codify the relationship between a genotype and an outcome. And here we're really going to focus largely on regression because of its flexibility, um, because of its flexibility. Um, okay. This is another thing that you'll see um, more about later, um, population stratification it was kind of the, um, ne the nemesis of GWAS, uh, population stratification was, er uh, early on at least. If we find a genetic association 
a magic p-value that uh, surpasses whatever flavor of significance level um, we've set. If we found an association, it can be due to the truth. We got it. We found what we wanted to find, or we found something that's legit. It can be due to chance, and it can be due to bias. Okay, so the, those three things are all possible. So if it's the truth, it's either the causal locus, and you are extraordinarily lucky. <laughs> if that's the case. It could be in LD with the it actually could be more than that, but it could be in LD with the, the causal locus. Again, the power of GWAS. So here you find that this A allele associates with your particular phenotype of interest, um, or you can't see here. It might be that the A allele associated with this phenotype only because it's in tight LD with this variant that you might not have genotyped, okay? Chance, and so I mentioned this magic number before, um, but just talking about multiple testing. Uh, generally speaking, if you test, if you run 100 tests and they're completely null, there's, there's nothing going on, and you run 100 well-powered tests you can expect around how many of them to get, confer significance at a 5% level. 5% of 100. So you expect about 5% of those to be declared significant, even if nothing's going on. Um, so uh, um, the association really is not, does not have a causal underpinning. And so here, again, this is the magic number on a, a, um, a Manhattan plot. Um, 5 times 10 to the negative 8. Look at this, this cutoff. This is 0.05. All of these above this are less than 0.05. Regardless of how well-funded you are, if you follow up all these variants, you will not be well-funded for long. <laughs> right? And so the question earlier was brought up about like, lowering the threshold, and I, I, I think that's dangerous. Um, you, you have to, it has to be very principled. Um, so that you don't um, go into those uh, um, rabbit holes. Um, okay, but it is just a scatter plot that's p-values against the um, chromosomal location. Um, GWAS has been, um, like a lot of the large-scale initiatives, GWAS has been um, pilloried at some level. It's, it's controversial for sure, and that controversy continues. It's, it's fascinating. Um, but there have been replicable findings that have shined new light on many, many different disease phenotypes. So there have been um, uh, new understandings of many diseases. This is an ideogram of, so these are all the chromosomes, and each dot is a phenotype SNP association at a P less than 5 times 10 to the negative 8. Kind of mind-blowing. Um, that's a little bit blown up. Okay, so bias, um, population. Uh, um, we'll see QQ plots tomorrow, so getting you towards tomorrow. A good way of looking and seeing if something's going on overall is there real hits, are there systematic problems. Um, in GWAS, if we're testing, say, 6 million variants, a million variants, a lot of variants, how many of those variants, if you're really lucky... How many of those variants do you think are truly associated with whatever disease phenotype you're investigating? A few number. If, you're, yeah, if you've got five, you, great work. If you've got the hundred, when you've got great work. But it's not going to be half, right? It's not going to be a quarter or 10%. You're looking at millions of SNPs, the vast majority of, of the associations, the vast majority of the distribution of test statistics are under the null distribution. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, but what I can do is I can transform my test statistics or I transform my p-values across the genome and see what's going on. The red line, so, so just really quickly, this, uh, this, this x-axis, you'll see this tomorrow, this x-axis is the expected... Um, it, it's the expected... Uh, height of your Manhattan plot across uh, the genome um, when you rank these test statistics or p-values. And this is what you actually see. If everything's under the null, you expect that red line to hit. Okay? So we know the, the distribution of the test statistics. Um, we know what that looks like. Um, we can draw this red line. Is everything under the null here? <laughs> 
No. So, so what's going on? What's that? There, there's some systematic inflation of, of our test statistics. That's a red flag. There's some systematic um, um, inflation of our test statistics. We, we've got to figure out what's going on. Oftentimes, um, um, what the culprit is is population stratification. There's an inflation of our test statistics because there's a confounder that we haven't properly adjusted for. And I'll talk briefly about that. Again, you'll, you'll see more. In this case, this is better in the sense that I trust it more, but it's not very exciting, right? Here's what you want, okay? So I just simulated these p-values and, and threw in a handful of real ones. So these guys, what you see is in the tail of the distribution, you see that um, change from the null distribution to the something's actually going on distribution, which might be a, a, um, an amalgam of several different distributions. But here you see um, the SNPs, the p-values lying on that line, and then taking off. Okay, so a genetic association, you find this, um, but really ancestry, so the population um, influences the, disease, the, disease, the putative disease allele frequency. Again, thinking about population genetics, I'm not a population geneticist, but the population allele frequencies are different, can be different in different populations. We saw that in all those large um, um, studies. If the population influences the disease allele frequency and the frequency of the disease, we have to, we have to adjust for that parent of the two um, pieces of our, in our analysis, the allele frequency and the disease frequency. So I have to somehow stratify or adjust for, in this case, ancestry. There's several ways to go about doing that. Um, it's, a, it's a confounder. Um, you go and, and realize that if you take people's yellow fingers and then you make them non-yellow, they don't get cured from lung cancer, um, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, um, this famous example, I think, spells this out f f well. Um, this uh, is prevalence of uh, diabetes and prevalence of a particular haplotype. And what you can see based on the proportion of um, Indian heritage, uh, number of grandparents, 0, 4, and 8, we see as that increases, the diabetes prevalence increases. As that increases, the prevalence of that haplotype decreases. Okay, so membership in this population influences both the haplotype probability and the probability of diabetes. Membership in this population affects both the haplotype probability and the probability of diabetes. Okay, so it's apparent of those two effects. And if I quantify it in a different way, um, prevalence in the full American Indian uh, population of diabetes is 40% compared to a Caucasian population, 15%. And then this haplotype, it's, it's very rare uh, in, the full, in the full heritage American Indians. And in the ca Caucasians, it's two-thirds. Okay. If I completely ignored ancestry, this is a very um, almost sterile example now. And I do a two-by-two two table. I quantify the prevalence of this particular haplotype in those with and without um, diabetes. I see a huge difference, an odds ratio of a quarter, right? I've, I've found it. I've found I'm going to cure diabetes with this uh, gene editing, this particular haplotype. But the problem there is what? It's completely confounded. If I were to do a simple stratification, we'll see a better resolution um, way to deal with this. If I simply look at the um, degree of, of Indian heritage, 
um, full, none, or a half. And then I look at um, diabetes prevalence. With and without that haplotype, the effect is completely vanished. So I've simply stratified on ancestry in an extraordinarily crude way, and that is completely gone because the ancestry was a confounder of the relationship between haplotype, in this case, and disease. Okay, so historical way of dealing with stratification, self-reported ancestry, not so good, matching and adjusting. Genomic control, uh, I mentioned earlier, this, or we saw in the QQ plot, this, this global um, inflation. S genomic control addressed that, but it did so at a, a genome-wide level rather than a local level. Structure was another way to deal with this. We'll see more about PCA tomorrow. Family-based designs, which we don't touch right now. Um, basically, I've taken, this lecture is a large part of a semester class. So why, why you have a lot of questions coming in and out. Um, we'll, we'll see more later. Um, at that, thank you. Questions? <laughs> Woo!